NASA sources say the remain of the Challenger cruise crew were recovered and brought ashore over the weekend. They say the wreckage of the crew cabin was found Friday and identified the next day by divers from the USS Preserver. That ship returned to port Saturday night under a cover of darkness and with no running lights. Sources say some remains of the crew members were taken off the ship at that time. NASA's official spokesman is refusing comment on that report. Meanwhile, relatives of crew members are criticizing NASA for not keeping them abreast of the news. Bruce Jarvis, father of Gregory Jarvis, says he is angry about the affair. I feel like I'm a man without a family. I, I feel that NASA is remiss in not having notified us. NASA says it did inform relatives after sonar readings located the cabin on Friday. What is the long-term effect of drinking? NASA will not confirm names of some of the Challenger astronauts have already been brought ashore. The Navy ship Preserver pulled into Cape Canaveral Saturday night. Sources at the space agency say the remains of some of the shuttle crew members were on board. NASA has confirmed that divers have found the shuttle crew cabin containing some of the remains on the bottom of the ocean. But it says it will not give any more details until the recovery operation is over. NASA officials report the remains of some of the seven Challenger astronauts have already been recovered and brought ashore. Striking Hormel workers act out there. Sources report that some remains of the Challenger astronauts have already been brought ashore. Now, NASA isn't commenting until the operation is completed. The space agency announced yesterday that it had located the space shuttle's crew cabin on the ocean floor. And in the wreckage, the remains of the seven astronauts who died in the January 28th explosion of the Challenger. What NASA did not announce, according to sources, is that a Navy ship in the darkness on Saturday brought into port some of those remains and parts of the cabin. Remains of the astronauts who died in the shuttle Challenger explosion have been recovered from the floor of the Atlantic. The remains were immediately taken to the Patrick Air Force Base's Institute of Pathology. Carl McNair, father of astronaut Ronald McNair, was shaken when he heard the news. NASA was not able to notify Mr. McNair. He heard the news from a family friend. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Reporting tonight from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. Remains of the space shuttle astronauts have not only been found, but have now been recovered from the floor of the Atlantic Ocean. And pathologists are reportedly examining those remains at an Air Force base in Florida. As ABC's Lynn Schur reports, the recovery task has been difficult, and it is not over yet. It took two sets of divers from the Navy ship, the USS Preserver, to confirm the sighting of the cabin on Saturday and bring back the first pieces of wreckage and human remains. Today, the ship was on location again, but high seas could delay the recovery process for several days. The crew compartment is lying in pieces in 100 feet of water about 18 miles northeast of the launch pad where it began its doomed journey. Sources say a number of NASA officials believe it broke up after the violent explosion, but before it hit the water some eight miles below. And impacting the water at speeds exceeding 500 miles an hour, it could not have remained intact. Air Force radar tracking the orbiter, as it does during every launch, followed the larger pieces into the Atlantic, so NASA has known the general area of the wreckage since the accident. But it took several weeks of checking out several dozen sonar targets on the ocean floor before the crew quarters was positively identified. The cabin, a three-story structure of aluminum alloy, is pressurized for flight, but neither it nor its human cargo would be expected to survive the crash to the sea. During Challenger's liftoff, Commander Dick Scobie and Pilot Mike Smith were seated at the controls on the flight deck, with Mission Specialist Judith Resnick and Ellison Onizuka behind them. One deck below, astronaut Ron McNair was seated with payload specialist Greg Jarvis and schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe. Today, Dr. Mm. McNair's father had this reaction now, to the discovery. I feel that we have had time to prepare ourselves for this, so it may not be quite as bad as it was originally. But Greg Jarvis's father was unhappy that all the family members weren't told immediately. I just like to, in the future, you know, when something like this, more comes up like this, I just like to know about it too. Meanwhile, most of the rest of the astronaut corps attended their regular weekly meeting in Houston today, where one of the items discussed was the internal memo disclosed over the weekend from Chief Astronaut John Young. In it, Young listed a number of safety problems he saw on previous missions and said the driving reason behind flying with what he called unsafe conditions was launch schedule pressure. 
Today, a NASA spokesperson said that all the issues raised in the memo had been reviewed several times before the Challenger accident. Still, a number of astronauts told ABC News today they think John Young's concerns are valid. And a subcommittee of the Presidential Commission will look into the same issues when they have meetings at the Johnson Space Center starting tomorrow. NASA sources said today that remains of the shuttle Challenger's crew recovered from the Atlantic over the weekend are being examined by pathologists at Cape Canaveral. The partial remains were found by divers in pieces of the crew compartment. It was not known if the remains of all seven lost crew members were recovered. After announcing that the cabin had been spotted in 100 feet of water, NASA said it would have nothing further to say publicly until the remains had been identified. Yesterday, the agency said it had spotted the cabin on Friday, but announced it only yesterday so that families of the astronauts could be informed first. But some family members said they learned from the media. One man's reaction came from Carl McNair, father of astronaut Ronald McNair. The father spoke at a news conference in New York. I feel that we're going to have to go through pretty much the same thing we went through weeks ago with the uh, memorial services. Uh, only this time it will be a funeral. Now, I feel that we have had time to prepare ourselves for this. So it may not be quite as bad as it was originally. There was times when I wanted them to discover the remains and there are times when I didn't, which is understandable. But now that they have uh, discovered it, I feel a bit more relieved at least we have something visi uh, visible to go by. NASA also said that salvage crews have recovered a two-ton piece of the left solid fuel rocket booster from the ocean floor and taken it to Cape Canaveral. Disaster narrowly averted during the shuttle launch just before the Challenger disaster. We have two reports beginning with Lynn Schur. Three, Columbia, the last three, shuttle to lift off one. successfully, we faced problems issue. potentially as catastrophic as the explosion that destroyed Challenger. ABC News has obtained an internal NASA memo written two weeks before the Challenger accident by the shuttle program's number two man, Arnold Aldrich. He documents a number of operations efficiency and safety issues related to the launch of Columbia on January 11th, a launch that took place after an unprecedented seven delays. During an attempt on January 6th, a console operator at the Cape inadvertently opened a valve on the external tank and wound up draining some 18,000 pounds of liquid oxygen out of the tank. The shuttle didn't launch for other reasons, and it was not until later that the lack of liquid oxygen was discovered. But had mission managers elected to launch without knowing about the propellant shortage, Columbia's engines would have shut down early and kept the shuttle from reaching proper orbit. Sources say it might have meant an emergency landing in Spain. The memo simply says it could have led to serious safety of flight consequences. Another potentially more hazardous situation occurred after a second launch abort. While processing the shuttle, technicians discovered that a temperature probe shaped like a nail had broken loose because of an inadequate weld and lodged in a valve leading to the main engine. No sensors detected it. Had Columbia launched with that probe there, the engine might have blown up eight minutes later when it tried to shut down. Congressman William Nelson was a passenger on the flight. And had we launched, it could have been potentially a bad day. And how do I feel about that? I don't like that one bit. Arnold Aldrich did not want to appear before a camera today, but he told ABC News that the problems were certainly safety critical areas and required strong action. He added that both were taken care of after they were discovered. Finally, ABC News has learned that after Columbia landed safely at Edwards Air Force Base in California, analysis showed that one of the brakes was damaged, a clear indication that they are still not working properly after 24 missions. The problems disclosed with the Columbia mission strengthen the arguments raised by astronaut John Young over a number of safety issues at NASA, issues he says make a lot of his colleagues very lucky people. Lynn Scher, ABC News, New York. This is Al Dale at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, where another memo by Chief Astronaut John Young surfaced today in the Houston Post. In it, dated January 6th, Young warned that continuing to land the shuttle at the Kennedy Space Center could result in crashes and loss of crew lives. Young cited Cape Canaveral's changeable weather, but zeroed in on what he felt were serious deficiencies of the runway, too short and with unreinforced shoulders. Most flights have landed at Edwards Air Force Base in the California desert. 
but five have ended at the Cape in order to save valuable turnaround time. Astronaut John McBride shares Young's concern. If there's a severe crosswind, and we don't know what kind of a crosswind we can sustain and operate in right now because we've never really got a good test on it. In an earlier memo made public over the weekend, Young listed a number of instances in shuttle flights where he said safety concerns gave way to launch schedule pressure. He said potentially catastrophic deficiencies went uncorrected in order to launch on time. Arnold Aldrich, the space shuttle manager here, told ABC News today that he disagrees with Young's memo that safety concerns took a back seat to launch schedule pressures. But other astronauts support Young. Knowing John the way I do, he doesn't make off-the-wall comments, and he doesn't write memos unless he's researched it thoroughly, and he knows what he's talking about. Top NASA officials who are analyzing Young's memo told ABC News that NASA is working to correct some of the defects mentioned. But those NASA officials stressed that on some of Young's concerns, nothing could be done. For example, Young suggested shielding the turbine wheel in the orbiter's auxiliary power units. The wheel spins at 77,000 revolutions per minute. And in a NASA test of such a shield, the wheel not only flew off and went through the test shield, but through a concrete wall. Thus, NASA says a shield would do no good. Though stressing it is subject to change, NASA has prepared a schedule for resuming shuttle flights. The first is set for next February, with eight more in 1987, most with military payloads. Al Dale, ABC News, Houston. Off Cape Canaveral today, divers headed back out to recover more debris from Challenger's crew compartment and more remains of the seven astronauts who died when the space shuttle exploded. The recovery efforts were delayed yesterday by high winds and eight-foot waves, but the weather improved today. NASA is keeping a strict lid on all information about the recovery effort. Canaveral, salvage ships continued their efforts to retrieve debris and human remains from the Challenger shuttle. Heavy winds and high winds had hampered the efforts after the discovery that the remains of the seven Challenger crew had been found in 100 feet of water 15 to 20 miles off the coast. Elizabeth Brackett has this report. NASA today released pictures of salvage crews recovering a large piece of the shuttle's left solid rocket booster. The piece is one of the largest pulled from the Atlantic Ocean since the Challenger exploded six weeks ago. Pieces of the suspect right solid rocket have not yet been brought ashore. While a fleet of 11 ships continues to search for wreckage today, most questions centered around the recent discovery of the crew compartment. Divers from the USS Preserver spotted the compartment last Friday. NASA will not confirm that any of the remains of the astronauts have been brought to the surface. But NASA does say that any assistance in identifying the crew will be conducted by the Armed Forces Institute of Pathology at nearby Patrick Air Force Base. While reporters poured over the few details being provided about the search, NASA stood by its word that no more information about the crew compartment would be released until after the salvage work is completed. The acting administrator of NASA, William Graham, told Congress today it would probably cost nearly $3 billion to build a shuttle to replace the lost Challenger. He also said it would be very appropriate to redesign the seals on the solid rocket boosters. Two more astronauts, Gordon Fullerton and Vance Brand, today publicly said that schedule pressures had reduced emphasis on safety. They agreed with the memo issued by Chief Astronaut John Young, who spoke of an awesome list of safety flaws. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Reporting tonight from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. NASA has made good progress today in its continuing efforts to recover parts of Challenger's crew compartment and remains of the seven astronauts. Publicly, the space agency is saying very little about the recovery effort, but radio transmissions from the scene suggest it is going well. ABC's Michael Connor is at the Kennedy Space Center. At first light this morning, the Navy salvage ship preserver was at work 16 miles off the Florida coast. A hundred feet below on the ocean floor lay the wreckage of Challenger's crew compartment. The preserver made several major lifts of debris, including one about 12.30 this afternoon. Entangled in the lift was a space suit, a white space suit uh, for the, uh, I believe it's called it 
EMU. Uh, it's used for the uh, spacewalks. Uh, uh, of course, the spacesuit was empty. The EMU, Extravehicular Mobility Unit, is a suit and backpack for spacewalks that is stored in the mid-deck airlock of the shuttle's crew compartment. Also in the compartment are three flight data recorders like these, which, if recovered undamaged, could provide critical information, according to the company that makes them. Uh, this is a multi-purpose recorder. It records the health of the engines, the pressures, temperature, accelerations. It records the crew, uh, conversations on board, the astronauts. Also, they can be used for payload data, actually the experiments that are back in the payload bay area of the orbiter. The preserver indicated this afternoon that recovery of the crew compartment was going well. It's coming up uh, fairly good-sized pieces. We're starting to fill up the fan tail. I'd say I have uh, less than half the fan tail available for uh, debris. NASA won't comment on the crew compartment because the remains of astronauts are involved. The agency did say, however, that a manned submersible from the research vessel Seward Johnson had videotaped wreckage that might very well be Challenger's suspect right rocket booster. NASA is still studying the pictures. Late this afternoon, the Seward Johnson radioed back that it had also made a major find, a very, very large piece of debris bored into the ocean floor. It's not clear yet what that debris is, but the Seward Johnson says it plans two more dives later tonight. Michael Connor, ABC News at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The suggestion that the shuttle Challenger may have been launched prematurely because of government pressure got a new twist today. Could some pressure in roundabout fashion have come from NASA officials trying to coordinate the launch with a major presidential speech. Lynn Scher reports. When President Reagan delivered his State of the Union address, delayed a week by the Challenger accident, he eulogized the crew of seven, including schoolteacher Krista McAuliffe, this way. We pause together to mourn and honor the valor of our seven Challenger heroes. But ABC News has obtained a text NASA had provided to the White House a month earlier. The draft input, a routine practice requested from all government agencies, came from the office of acting NASA Administrator Dr. William Graham. And assuming a successful launch before the speech, it suggested the president include these comments. Tonight, while I am speaking to you, a young elementary school teacher from Concord, New Hampshire, is taking us all on the ultimate field trip as she orbits the Earth as the first citizen passenger on the space shuttle. Krista McAuliffe's journey is a prelude to the journeys of other Americans living and working together in a permanently manned space station in the mid-1990s. Mrs. McAuliffe's week in space is just one of the achievements in space we have planned for the coming year. Today, at the request of ABC News, the White House released the text of the President's planned address. And while it does mention Challenger, there is no reference to Mrs. McAuliffe. Presidential spokesman Larry Speak said NASA's draft was filed and forgotten. But a number of sources within NASA have suggested that internal pressure, perhaps accelerated by the idea of inclusion in the president's address, may have contributed to the fateful decision to launch Challenger. Former NASA general manager Phil Culbertson, who signed the draft input, told ABC News he never felt any pressure to launch because of the scheduled speech. Dr. Graham is out of the country, but his aide, Charles Kupperman, told us it's ludicrous to think there was any pressure because of a planned speech. Still, a source close to the Presidential Commission investigating the accident said today, the Commission is sensitive to the issue of pressures that may be real or perceived by NASA management and that could influence the way people make decisions. We're trying to see if they exist and we cannot eliminate any source. That's only one of the issues the Commission is looking at, as working panels around the country continue to review everything from photographic evidence to failure scenarios. Lynn Scher, ABC News, Washington. The Navy says that it may have found part of the right rocket booster which has been blamed for the explosion of the shuttle Challenger. That word from Navy divers off the coast of Florida. Elizabeth Brackett reports on the continuing underwater search for clues and the ongoing investigation into the causes of the accident. Four members of the Presidential Commission, plus top NASA officials, met at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama today to hear results of new tests done to try and pinpoint the cause of the Challenger explosion. The NewsHour has learned that the panel will review a new series of tests done to determine if a possible defect in the steel casing on the right solid rocket booster caused that rocket to fail shortly after liftoff. The tests were conducted by engineers from Marshall and from Morton Thiokol, the manufacturer of the rocket booster. Investigators believe the steel casing could have failed at or near the seam that joins the rocket segments for several reasons. 
One, the steel casing on 51L had been used on four previous flights and could have been weakened. Two, wind shears 35 seconds into the flight may have caused the weakened steel to give way. Three, the steel casing may have been damaged when a special tool was used to make the rocket segments round enough to fit together. Panel members will also hear test results on the putty used to seal the rocket's joints. Investigators want to know if the low temperatures on launch day affected the ability of the putty to seal the rocket's joints. While commission members review tests on rocket booster parts in Alabama, the search for the damaged rocket continues here off Cape Canaveral in Florida. And NASA said today that parts of the lower portion of a rocket booster have been found. They say it is likely that the piece is from the right-hand booster rocket. Commission members have said repeatedly, if that critical piece is found... ...file announced the space shuttle recovery team back to shore today, and officials believe the ship may be tied up for two or three days. As ABC's Lynn Scher reports from Florida, late last night, one of the recovery ships came in with more remains of the Challenger crew. This was the scene aboard the USS Preserver as it came into port last night. Navy men in dress blues standing guard over a flag-draped container with some of the remains of Challenger's seven crew members. The ship arrived with no lights and no fanfare after almost a day and a half at sea. Ambulances from nearby Patrick Air Force Base were standing by to transport the contents to a NASA laboratory for identification and analysis. The examinations will be carried out at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station by pathologists from the armed forces. The preserver also brought in debris from the shuttle itself, but that's the last wreckage to arrive to date. Today, rough seas churned up by high winds prevented the salvage operations from continuing. The seas were high enough this morning that uh, the putting divers in the water and recovering them safely was just impossible. Late today, NASA released these pictures of a large chunk of debris from one of the solid rocket boosters, but they don't know which one. And yesterday, the Seward Johnson made a potentially more significant find, about four feet by five feet, of which there are no pictures. Again, NASA doesn't know if it's part of the right or left solid rocket booster, but it does show a damaged joint, not from flames. It was the joint on the right booster that suspected of triggering the Challenger explosion. Getting a look at that section of the right booster is a critical part of the investigation. But continuing high winds here may prevent them from getting started on the recovery tomorrow. Lynn Scher, ABC News, Kennedy Space Center, Florida. Still on the subject of the shuttle, ABC News has learned that more than three years ago, the solid rocket booster contractor, Morton Thiokol, warned NASA of a dangerous and deadly problem with the O-ring seals. As ABC's Al Dale reports, despite that warning, the shuttle continued to fly and no corrective actions were taken. ABC News has learned that following structural analysis experiments on the O-rings in 1982, the manufacturer Morton Thiokol told NASA of their safety concerns. We warned them, a company official told ABC News, because we thought we had a potential catastrophe on our hands. The contractor warned that a primary O-ring seal was so likely to fail, leaving only the secondary rings, that it violated NASA's own redundancy or backup safety standards. NASA officials reportedly argued with Morton Thiokol, then reluctantly agreed that there was a problem. But top NASA officials who don't want to be identified told us that instead of moving to correct the O-ring problem, middle management resorted to a paperwork solution, a waiver exempting the O-rings from the backup requirement. If they had stopped to solve the O-ring situation, the shuttle program could have been set back more than a year at a cost of millions of dollars. Those senior NASA officials who spoke with ABC News said they never knew about the waiver or the O-ring problem. One said, that was the thing I fought the system on. When they realized it wasn't redundant, they should have been working on it to make it redundant. In one instance cited by the NASA sources, however, the agency did move to fix a problem with the solid rocket boosters. A NASA team at Morton Thiokol looked into erosion and pitting in the critical solid rocket booster nozzle. Finding the fault was poor carbon cloth insulation, they fired the subcontractor. But nearly three years passed and 12 missions before NASA fully addressed the O-ring problem last August, resulting in these 43 alternate O-ring designs and this recommendation by Thiokol. 
Changes must be incorporated as soon as possible to reduce criticality, a term used to mean possible loss of mission and loss of life. Still, a top NASA official said the problem was not corrected, and as recently as February 26th, one month after the Challenger explosion, Lawrence Malloy, a NASA middle management official responsible for the solid rocket boosters, insisted that the SEALs had redundancy, or 1R in NASA jargon. Mr. Malloy, in the interest of clarity, could you just simply state, was it 1 or 1R? It was 1R, sir. Presidential commission members had their doubts that Malloy was correct, and sources close to the investigation say Malloy was wrong and that the deficiency was never corrected. A top Morton Thiokol official charged that NASA still is not listening to the rocket builders on the O-ring problem. The official said Thiokol's full-scale tests of the SEALs won't be finished for at least two more weeks. And NASA's claim that its own tests show the SEALs should have been good to a temperature of minus 10 degrees is baloney. Al Dale, ABC News at the Johnson Space Center, Houston. NASA has recovered the flight recorders aboard the shuttle Challenger. That's according to the firm that made the flight recorders, Odetics Incorporated. It says NASA informed it that all five recorders and some computers from the Challenger have been found. They may carry valuable information for the investigation into the cause of the shuttle explosion. Recovery ships were unable to work in the Atlantic today because of high seas and bad weather. But NASA did release some pictures of the debris it has found so far. We get the latest from the Kennedy Space Center now from CNN's Tom Mentir. These pictures may or may not be critical pieces of evidence NASA has been searching 300 square miles of ocean for. One of the pieces is a 10-foot section of the shuttle's solid rocket booster. But until it's pulled out of the mud 600 feet below the surface, NASA engineers can't be sure if it comes from the suspect right side. Late Wednesday, under the cover of darkness and inside the secure fences of a Trident submarine base, NASA did receive the remains of the Challenger astronauts. As the USS Preserver pulled into Port Canaveral, a flag-draped container was surrounded by several sailors in dress blue uniforms. The honor guard was standing at what's called parade rest, a military function reserved for ceremonial occasions. The dress uniforms are not worn by salvage crews. Shortly after the preserver pulled up to the dock at Port Canaveral, eight stretchers were loaded into three waiting military ambulances. Then, a huge crane on the dock hoisted what appeared to be the flight deck of Challenger onto a flatbed truck. Wires and cables could be seen dangling below the crew compartment, possibly indicating that it had been shattered. The remains of the Challenger astronauts are now located in this building. It's called Hangar L. Hangar L is the life sciences support facility. NASA normally uses this building and its laboratories for medical studies of spaceflight. It will now be the site where medical examinations of the astronauts' bodies will be performed. Bad weather moving into the Florida area has all but suspended Navy sea search efforts. Six to eight foot seas have forced most of the fleet of 11 recovery ships back to port. The stormy seas are expected to continue for the next two or three days, further delaying more salvage efforts. Throughout the recovery efforts for the bodies of the seven Challenger astronauts, NASA officials have refused to confirm what has been recovered. The announcement that a secure facility on NASA property will serve as a temporary morgue is the first official indication that the bodies of the astronauts have even been recovered. Tom Intier, CNN at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. NASA's top engineer at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, says that investigators are close to pinpointing the cause of the Challenger explosion. Dr. James Kingsbury also said that the next shuttle that goes up will have some engineering changes. For example, he says the joints on the solid rocket boosters will be redesigned. Also today, physicist Richard Feynman, a member of the presidential panel investigating the disaster, says they now are focusing only on the solid rocket boosters, that the external fuel tank has been ruled out as the cause. Let's go to Bernard Shaw in Washington for him. A former shuttle passenger is opening his own hearings into shuttle safety. Florida Representative Bill Nelson, who flew on the shuttle Columbia, says his decision is based on two internal memos. Written by Chief Astronaut John Young, the memos are critical of shuttle safety decisions. The question is, has the flight safety been given its primary importance? And there is a question mark there raised by these two memos, which we're going to explore in our hearings. 
Congressman Nelson says his investigation will not specifically focus on the Challenger accident. Rather, it will look into safety procedures questioned by astronaut Young. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Reporting tonight from Washington, Ted Koppel. Good evening. John Zarella, CNN, Miami. The investigation into the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger continued behind closed doors today. The Presidential Commission looking into the tragedy held a... NASA representatives were seen carrying film to the session. The commission is expected to... ...next Friday. Meanwhile, BAD recover more debris today for salvage ships to return to port. Zoom tomorrow, weather permitting. What is the legal <coughs> definition of motherhood? Sounds like a simple enough question. Part relief that then exploded. At this point, they don't know whether that or simply the heat of the flames or perhaps something else caused the shuttle to blow up. Ground controllers had no inkling of the problem ahead of time because the data was only retrieved from computers after the accident, not displayed on their screens. As for the rupture in the rocket itself, the first failure in 50 made and tested by Morton Thiokol, today an expert in rocket technology said NASA had ignored earlier warnings from him that a series of vibrations from heated gas inside the boosters was potentially dangerous. It would cause uh, possibly a cracking or a debonding of the propellant grain. This would allow the hot gases in the combustion to get closer to the wall of the chamber and this would cause uh, possibly the, the rupture that we saw on the side of the tank. That is only one theory that could be investigated by the Presidential Commission appointed yesterday. They are scheduled to hold their first meeting here tomorrow. A top NASA official says the news media is to blame for 98% of the pressure to launch the doomed space shuttle Challenger. In a Washington Post interview, Richard Smith also criticized the Special Presidential Commission. Smith says it is blaming NASA before all the facts are in. He says all the criticism will mean a mass exodus of NASA personnel once the shuttle program gets back on track. High seas and heavy winds today force several NASA search ships to turn back to Port Canaveral. But at least two ships were working to lift wreckage of the shuttle's boosters. They are considered the key pieces in the shuttle investigation. The recovery of the wreckage has not been easy, but much of the credit goes to the remote-controlled submersibles. They go where the divers dare not. CNN's Andrew Holtz reports from El Cajon, California. The Challenger salvage teams include sailors, submarine crews, and divers, but also unmanned vehicles that fill a unique niche in the potentially dangerous operations. One of the remote-controlled vehicles is the Gemini powerful submersible which can dive to 5,000 feet and operate in swift currents. Apparently the surface currents there are in the five to eight knot range and some of the smaller submersibles can't operate in that. The Gemini is an upgraded version of the Scorpio submersible manufactured by Amatec Straza of El Cajon, California. The Scorpio and Gemini were developed for dangerous deep sea oil operations. As seen by video from another sub, the remote vehicles can do the work of divers without the risks or limitations. The submersibles don't get the bends, and they can stay underwater for more than a day at a time, searching with sonar, seeing through video cameras, and working with mechanical arms. In salvage operations, the search area is scanned from the surface by sonar. When a target is found, the submersible goes after it. They'll approach it with their own search sonar and then they'll verify it with television and then attach the lifting lines, or in some cases, they can pick up small pieces of debris. Submersibles like the Gemini and Scorpio have helped investigators find important clues to the Challenger disaster while reducing the risks of underwater operations so that no more lives will be lost. Andrew Holtz, CNN, El Cajon, California. A Soviet space capsule today docked with the Soviet Union's new space station called Mir, which means peace in Russian. Then two Soviet cosmonauts climbed in and gave a televised tour of what the Soviets hope may become the first permanently manned space laboratory. The roomy space station has a work desk, a sleeping cabin, and a kitchen. The cosmonauts laughed and joked during the tour, which was broadcast on the Soviet evening news. The broadcast reported that it took the cosmonauts 49 hours to reach the station, but it didn't say just how long the two will remain aboard. Rick? reporters for putting pressure on NASA to launch Challenger. Smith says, and I quote, every time there was a delay, the press would say, look, there's another delay. Here's a bunch of idiots who can't even handle a launch schedule. You think that doesn't have an impact? If you think it doesn't, you're stupid. 
Also during the interview, Smith said there was a serious flaw in the Thiokol process of going to launch and said the company would have to justify its actions. He also predicted a mass exodus of senior NASA officials who may retire after the investigation and blame the presidential commission for possibly damaging NASA's reputation. Shortly after the interview, Smith reportedly called the Post reporter asking that the interview not be published. Richard Smith refused to grant an interview with CNN prior to the Post report and through a NASA spokesman relayed a rejection of yet another request Saturday stating he wasn't feeling well. The NASA organization has suffered some uncharacteristic cracks since the Challenger disaster. In addition to the critical John Young memos, another NASA astronaut has now come forward to announce that he has learned equipment failures nearly cost him his life. Astronaut Don Lynn says that during the launch of Challenger last year, one of the solid rocket booster's O-rings failed and a second seal was 80% gone. Lynn says his Space Lab 3 mission came second closest to destruction and he didn't learn of the problem until after the Challenger disaster. Lynn says he is distressed because astronauts were not being told of the risks of flying the space shuttle. Those concerns will be aired publicly in the near future. In addition to the Presidential Commission, a House subcommittee that oversees NASA will be holding hearings on the astronauts' concerns. The Presidential Commission also appears to be taking a more critical approach to NASA test procedures used in the investigation. The Commission has decided to appoint its own private panel of experts to verify NASA tests used in the investigation that are attempting to recreate the cause of the Challenger tragedy. Tom Mintier, CNN at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida.